Let us go up and cleanse the sanctuary and dedicate it. Let us go up and cleanse the sanctuary and dedicate it. That is what the Maccabees said. Now there's something about having to actually do some sanctuary cleansing that kind of changes how we hear a story like this. If you were on the outdoor crew yesterday, and I know some of you were, you probably wrapped up the afternoon a bit sore and in need of a shower. And whether you were here yesterday or not, it isn't hard to see the results of all that work and understand the effort that went into it. Now, every year, we do essentially the same thing. And we understand that our set of tasks require a level of dedication, even as we know that our situation, compared to that of those Maccabees, is pretty luxurious. We didn't arrive at church having fought a war today. And although we do at times make something of a mess, we don't nearly wreck the place like the armies of King Antiochus IV. But come spring, after a long church year of worship and coffee hour and Sunday school events and concerts and youth group coffee houses and funerals and weddings and praying Indian services and those lectures held jointly by the Historical Society and the Bacon Free Library, the place needs a bit of an airing out. It needs cleaning. It needs landscaping, planting, planning, and arranging. So we get it. We get it, even though so many years lie between us, we get at least that from time to time, the sanctuary and everything around it needs to be cleansed. But here's the thing. This is also the time to dedicate it. And the word dedication implies something a bit different. Now, in Maccabees, the dedication was an event unto itself. At the very season and on the very day that the Gentiles had profaned it, the book of Maccabees says, it was dedicated with songs and harps and lutes and cymbals. All the people fell on their faces and worshipped and blessed heaven who had prospered them. And in a sense, though in a much more low-key sort of way, we are rededicating the sanctuary too. And we are doing it by rededicating ourselves to the church and to its work. We don't do it with prayers or rituals, so much as with other sorts of actions. When we clean and repair our buildings, we know that this is just the first step in the work of the church. And when we get down to the work of the church, we know we are doing it for the greater good. We know that we are committing ourselves, dedicating ourselves to something larger than just us. And perhaps even something holy, something transcendent, something that in return cleanses us. Now the Maccabees knew that their dedication of and to the temple set them apart from their neighbors. It marked them as different from other people, even as they moved through a diverse and cosmopolitan world. And we too are set apart in a way. And we too set ourselves up as a community, as a congregation, unique and yet connected to our larger culture and society. And because of the state of that culture, we also know that we are facing a challenge and a threat to our existence. We are, in fact, facing a challenge and a threat to our existence. Now, perhaps that threat is neither as fast-moving or as violent as Antiochus, and thank God for that. But nonetheless... It is something that deserves our attention. For if we do not learn how to adapt, we won't be able to hand our community on to those who follow. The fact is, 
While we do our best to maintain our Elliott Church, we live in a rapidly evolving society. And most religious institutions, in fact, most voluntary organizations, are in some kind of crisis, some kind of decline. Forces beyond our control are changing the way that we, as human beings, congregate. And how we, as members of this congregation, rise to this change in fortune will say a great deal about us and about what we will be like in the future. Now in our reading today from Jeff Jones, he writes that we live in a liminal time. I had to practice that this morning. Liminal. We live in a liminal time, a time betwixt, also had to pronounce, pronounce that, and between. Virtually all the old answers, he says, about what it means to be and do church don't work anymore. And he's right. This challenge is real. The difficulty we find maintaining traditional institutions comes from the way we actually live today, pushing against the way things have always been. And since the Reformation, since the Reformation doing church has been pretty much the same. But now, we aren't so sure. There have been cultural shifts in how we spend our time. The struggle to survive and thrive in this world has made us busy and non-reflective. Rampant individualism has made selfishness a virtue in many places. In addition, there have been technological shifts that have changed how we communicate. And the lessons that we have learned over the past few centuries through the sciences and the humanities have challenged the deeply held truths of many other more traditional faiths. But there's good news. There really is good news. Because all of that means that there is still a reason for a strong and healthy Elliott Church. There is still a need for a reflective community like our own, perhaps more of a need than ever before. So we are called to minister in the midst of a society that is in flux. And we have our work cut out for us, as we always do. You see, even as we go through the same, in some sense, sacred motions, from the joining together in worship on Sunday morning to filling the herb bed on Saturday afternoon, we are faced with a change in what our dedication is about. For now, cleansing the sanctuary means more than bringing order to the chaos and marching on with the timeless confidence of an ancient institution. Now, now we must dedicate ourselves to finding new ways of being a congregation, bringing the best of the old with us into a new and uncertain future. So, as we get ready to step out of worship and onto that next task of cleansing, let us take a moment in silence to dedicate ourselves, to dedicate ourselves to the work ahead.